Okay. So unit three starts today. We have uh, three lectures in this unit, and powering the cell is the title. So we'll start by to, uh, today talking about ATP. We've already talked about the importance of ATP being involved in um, cellular work, and then we'll talk about enzymes as well. Yes. Will unit three be covered on the midterm? Yes, and um, unit four will not. So this is the last set of lectures that will be covered on the midterm. Okay, then we will move in lecture 11 to cellular respiration, which is basically really talking about how cells generate ATP from the fuels that they take in. And then we'll go to photosynthesis in lecture 12, where we talk about how the fuels are generated to uh, produce uh, the fuel, how we generate the fuels that are used by cellular res respiration in, in making ATP. And so what I really want you to know is how these processes are interrelated. Okay, we're going to start this lecture by talking, or actually this unit, by talking about energy sources and the cells in your body all of their energy comes from the food that you eat. And so in honor of upcoming holiday, Halloween, I have brought with me a pumpkin to represent the fuel that our cells are going to use to um, do cellular work and generate ATP. And so I had to carry this from my lab is over on the medical side of the campus, so I had to carry this a long way. Somebody want to tell me about how much this weighs? Grams or? No, oh, good. Grams or pounds, whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know in grams, but five to ten pounds is what it weighs. It weighs it's a heavy thing, right? I, I really didn't, it was a hot day. I didn't really want to walk across campus with this. But what is the molecule that makes up most of the weight of this pumpkin? Water. That's right. Water is what makes up most of the weight in this pumpkin. If I was to take all of the water out of this and make a pumpkin chip, dehydrated pumpkin, what would be the most common macromolecule of the four macromolecules we talked about in the last two lectures that makes up the pumpkin? Carbohydrates. That's exactly right. That's the most common. OK. What about the other macromolecules? For example, does this pumpkin have protein in it? Yes. OK. What proteins are in this pumpkin? Can you name a protein in this pumpkin? You're right. There are proteins in that pumpkin. And we talked about a lot of these proteins already. Yes. Pardon? Tubulin. That's exactly right. What's a pumpkin made up of? They're cells, right? What are in cells? Cytoskeletal elements. Tubulin is a, a subunit that makes up microtubules. So what other proteins? Oh, okay. So, so we, there's, we definitely have sucrose, but that's the carbohydrate, right? And so proteins, we have, yes? Yeah. Pardon? Proton pumps. We have proton pumps, we have sodium potassium pumps, we have motor proteins, right? All of those proteins we found in a cell. Do we have lipids? Yes, where are they? In the cell membrane, in the rough ER, in the smooth ER, right? And so do we have nucleic acids? Yes, yes. where are they? In the nucleuses of the cells that make up the pumpkin. Okay. So what do all, so all the four types of macromolecules that we've talked about are present because the pumpkin is made up of cells. And what is, what do they all have in common? They, they are all carbon-based molecules, right? And so they have carbon-based skeletons in our um, Halloween theme. And so that brings us to our next clicker question, which is, or where did most of the carbon that make up the macromolecules in the pumpkin come from? <laughs> <laughs> OK. 
Okay, most of you have clicked in, so go ahead and do so if you haven't. Okay, I'm going to give you another chance. <laughs> but I'm going to give you a hint. Okay. Where did most of the carbon that makes up the macromolecules in my staghorn fern, shown on my front porch, on a board that is hung on the wall, where did most of those come from? Okay. Okay, very good. That helped you get to the right answer. So this um, clearly demonstrates that you are being truthful and not remembering very much about cellular respiration and photosynthesis. And the really important issue here is that, um, so what is the molecule in the air that's making the carbon-based compounds? Carbon dioxide, exactly. So we're going to be talking about how carbon is fixed into making sugars during the process of photosynthesis. And then in cellular respiration, we'll talk about those, how those are broken down to make ATP. Okay, today we are going to focus on ATP and enzymes. And like I said, we've talked about AP, ATP being important for cellular work. And it's important for mechanical work. We talked about the motor proteins that were moving alongside the skeletal elements. We talked about transport work, where ATP is important in helping move ions up, um, up their concentration gradient through transport proteins. And we haven't talked too much about this chemical work, but we'll talk about that at the end. But it's, the idea is that we take our monomers and our macromolecules and we put them together, and that takes energy because we're uh, forming higher energy molecules when we're forming polymers from monomers. Okay. So here is our general exergonic reaction, which is defined as a reaction that releases energy. On this axis, we have free energy, and this is the progress of the reaction on the x-axis. In an exergonic reaction, the reactants have a higher free energy than the product, so energy is released, and by convention, the amount of energy released is uh, called delta G, and it's less than zero. So if energy is released, it's a negative number. So exergonic reactions have a delta G of less than zero. The opposite of this is an endergonic reaction, which requires energy input to go forward. And here we have free energy and the progress of the reaction again on the x-axis. And we have the reactants that start out at low free energy compared to the products that are at high free energy. So this requires investment of energy, and the amount of energy required is delta G, and it's a positive value. OK, which of the following endergonic um, uh, reactions that we've looked at so far is an endergonic reaction? So you have to identify the ones where the products are lower free energy, um, or higher free energy, sorry, than the reactants. Okay, click in if you haven't. Okay, good. The majority of you got this question correct, which is A. So in this case, we have amino acids. You have to remember those are the monomers that are put together with what type of bonds to form polypeptides? Peptide bonds, exactly. So polypeptides that have a bunch of amino acids put together are at a higher free energy than the reactants, so that's an endergonic reaction. So we need energy, cellular energy, to make that process occur. B is a disaccharide, so that's two 
sugar monomers that are put together, and they are, uh, the products are monosaccharides, and so this is higher free energy than that, so that's what type of reaction? An exergonic reaction, that's exactly right. And ATP is the molecule that's often used for cellular work, and that one is broken down into ADP and PI, releasing free energy, and that's what we're going to look at um, in the next slide, and so that's also an exergonic reaction. So ATP powers cellular work by coupling exergonic reactions, like this one, to endergonic reactions, like this one. Okay, here is ATP hydrolysis. We have the molecule ATP shown up here. It looks kind of like one of the molecules we looked at in last lecture. Anybody remember? It's a nucleic acid monomer, right, from RNA. It has a five carbon sugar, adenine, and instead of having just a single phosphate group, it has three phosphate groups on it. Remember those phosphate groups, right? They're highly negatively charged. They're in a, you know, all basically put in a relatively small uh, space. And so this is a relatively unstable bond that you have, and the electrons are at high energy. In the presence of water, what happens is this terminal bond is broken between this phosphate group and these phosphate groups. And you get ADP, so you have this molecule, ADP, plus PI, which is this part that's broken off, and energy is released. And so if we look at PI, this is actually what it looks like. So it's this molecule, it's right here, right, the phosphate with the oxygens, and it has an OH group attached. There's also a free hydrogen ion. Where did these come from? It came from the water. So when this OH bond was formed, it is, uh, the electrons are at a lower energy. This is a more stable intermediate. All of these are more stable molecules than this molecule. And so there's been free energy released. And this free energy can then be harnessed to drive cellular reactions. Before we look at how it drives cellular reactions, we're also going to talk about the role of enzymes in biological reactions. And this is an energy profile of an exergonic reaction, but this is a biological reaction rather than the general reaction I showed you on the previous um, two or three slides ago. Still, we have free energy on our y-axis and progress of the reaction on the x-axis. We have our reactants here that are at higher free energy than our products over here. But what we have is something in between, which is an uh, energy hump, which is called the activation energy. In this reaction, we have A and B as the one starting reactant molecules and CD. So they're bonded to each other in that fashion. What has to happen is that bond between A and B is broken and forms between A and C, and the bond between C and D is broken, and there's a bond that forms here. So the first thing that has to happen is you have to break old bonds, and then you have to form new bonds, and that's shown here. So we've broken those bonds, and now we form new bonds. And these products are at lower free energy than these reactants, and so that's called an exergonic reaction. But to get to that reaction to proceed, it had to go over an activation energy, which is shown here, Ea. So it couldn't just run downhill. It actually had to, um, there's an activation energy that stops it from proceeding spontaneously. OK, what could you do to speed up the rate of this uh, chemical reaction in a biological system? So here's the reaction that we had just showed you, and here are your three choices.
Okay, go ahead and click in. Okay, very good. The majority of you got this answer right, which was increased heat. So if you increase the product concentration, that's gonna, not going to make the reaction proceed faster. Decrease the delta G, that's not going to make it occur faster, but you could, in fact, increase the heat. And so you increase the kinetic energy, and so the transition from the reactants to the product speeds up. The problem is, in biological reactions, there are negative consequences to increasing the energy. Under, unlike the chemistry experiment that you might be doing, which you, you know, put a Bunsen burner on, under and make the reaction go faster, what happens when you heat up cells? Denature proteins is one of the things that happens that's really bad, right? So a protein starts, the proteins in the cells start to denature, then they go into what, um, what other protein complex to try and get refolded? Chaperone and proteins. If they can't get refolded, then they get tagged with what? Ubiquitin and they get moved to proteasome where what bonds are broken? Peptide bonds, that's exactly right. So this is not going to work for biological reactions by and large. So how do you speed up a biological reaction without heating it up? And the answer is enzymes are what does this. So en enzymes decrease the activation energy. So the profile shown here, we have free energy and progress of the reaction. If you have reactants with no enzymes, then the formation of products is governed by this type of line, where the activation energy is relatively high. So it will proceed less rapidly from reactants to products. If you have an enzyme, then you can decrease the activation and you can increase the rate that products are formed. Okay, so why would you want to have something like this? Why would you want to have an enzyme that has to um, control this reaction? Yes? Yeah, so it would be that if you want to actually have a process occur, you want to know where and when. You want to be able to control where and when in a cell, right? So if there was no barrier in between the, the reactants and the product, so this uh, reaction was just allowed to run downhill, ATP in the cell would rapidly become what? ADP, right? It would get all used up, even though you might not need ADP, uh, ATP at that time. So enzymes are a way of controlling where and when reactions occur, and they have to have an activation energy that stops them from occurring spontaneously. And so cells will regulate enzymes that are controlling reactions to regulate what's happening in the cell in response to environmental stimuli, what's happening inside the cell, or what's happening outside the cell. And those are signals that we have talked about are mediated by the receptors, right? Okay, which of the measures of free energy in this diagram would be the same in the presence and absence of an enzyme and why? Okay, click in if you haven't. Okay, very good. The majority of you have the answer correct, which is D. So in the presence of and the absence of an enzyme, what is this? Measurement, the free energy, right, of the reaction, because and that doesn't change in the um, presence or an absence of an enzyme because it all occurs below this activation energy line. So here's the activation energy, and if you have an enzyme, then you decrease the activation energy. That that will decrease the A, B, C, and E, but it won't change D. Okay, so you have to know how those are interrelated. Okay, this next slide, I've taken some liberties with one of the pictures in your book, the diagrams in your book that shows a, shows a sort of a general enzyme reaction and added some reactants and products to help you understand how this works and really to visualize what's happening in an enzyme reaction. Okay, so we have an enzyme sucrase 
which is an enzyme that's going to take a disaccharide, which is glucose and fructose, that's joined by what type of bond? Glycosidic bond, and it's going to separate it into um, the two monomers, glucose and fructose. So sucrose has both of those monomers together, so it's a disaccharide. In the presence of water, then, and, and, and um, sucrose and water, in the presence of this sucrase enzyme, then those two will bind to the enzyme and they will be brought very close together. So if you have sucrose and you stick it in water without any enzyme, it will basically stay sucrose dissolved in water. It will not turn into fructose and glucose. However, if you put this enzyme in there, what happens is the sucrose and the water will be brought into um, a conformation that actually brings them very close together and puts a strain on the molecular bonds. And so that strain actually causes the bonds to become less stable and more likely to form bond, the bonds that are associated with the monomers rather than the disaccharide. So what the job of the enzyme here, the how it lowers the activation energy, is by bringing these into very close proximity and putting some constraints or strain on the molecular bonds. That then increases the probability that those bonds will break and newer, lower energy bonds will form. And so then we'll get glucose and fructose, which you know are at lower free energy than the sucrose that it started out as. So in this type of diagram, and then once they're released, then this sucrase, this enzyme can work again, right? So it doesn't get used up in the reaction. So what happened to the water? Yes. Exactly. It was a dehydration reaction, um, not a dehydration reaction, it was a hydrolysis reaction. And it gave an OH from water onto one of the molecules, glucose, and it put an H from the water onto the fructose. Okay, so that's exactly right. So when you're looking at a diagram like this, you be thinking about the fact that the, how the activation energy is getting lowered is by being, bringing these molecules into close proximity so those bonds can be um, strained and broken and lower energy bonds formed. Okay, here's a short animation. So when you walk into a film, you have one that releases energy, some energy must be added to get the reaction going. This energy is needed to break bonds in the reactant molecules. The energy needed to start a chemical reaction is called the energy of activation, Ea. This required energy input represents a barrier that prevents even energy-releasing reactions from occurring without some added energy. How does a living cell overcome the energy barrier so that its metabolic reactions can occur quickly and precisely? A special kind of protein called an enzyme is the answer. An enzyme serves as a biological catalyst, increasing the rate of a reaction without being changed into a different molecule. An enzyme does not add energy to a reaction. Instead, it speeds up a reaction by lowering the energy barrier. An enzyme is very selective. Its three-dimensional shape allows it to act only on specific molecules, referred to as the enzyme's substrates. As the substrates bind to the enzyme's active site, they are held in a position that facilitates the reaction. This takes less activation energy than the unended reaction. Products form and are released. The enzyme emerges unchanged from the reaction. Because of the specific fit between enzyme and substrate, each enzyme can catalyze only one kind of reaction involving specific substrates. Thousands of different enzymes may be required to carry out all of the cell's metabolic properties. Okay, so the important points here are that every reaction, every um, set of substrates has their own enzyme. And an enzyme is what type of macromolecule? It's a protein. That's exactly right. So if a protein is heated up, it unfolds, that enzyme that may be involved in a reaction is not going to work very well, right? So uh, all reactions have both an appropriate, a right temperature and pH for the uh, protein to have its right conformation to mediate the reaction. And then it's going to have very specific binding sites to the reactants. 
Also, it does not get used up in the reaction. This diagram shows the progress of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. If an inhibitor of the enzyme were added to the reaction vessel, how would this change the reaction? Okay. Click in. Very good. The majority of you got this answer right, which is the activation energy would increase. So an enzyme is going to decrease the activation energy. If you inhibit the activity of the enzyme, then the activation energy is going to increase. And one of the reasons I put this on, um, I was on a, we put a version of this on an exam a few years ago, is because I wanted to illustrate the fact that the N type uh, MCAT type questions, which this was from two years ago, um, are, appear on the questions that appear on the MCAT exam. This was one of them, and they actually are changing the MCATs and emphasizing concepts more than they have in the past um, in, for uh, the future for future MCATs starting, I think, in 2014, and all the other standardized tests are following, as I understand it. And so you really have to understand the basic concepts. This is one of the types of basic concepts that you have to understand. And so a lot of students say when they're um, studying for their MCATs, their GREs, their um, pre-dental, um, ex uh, the exams get into dental school, ophthalmology, et cetera, they come back to Bio 93 concepts. And if they learn, go back and remember those basic concepts and then add some of the details on that they learn in the later years, that they really um, find that a very effective strategy for studying. So the things you're learning now are going to be important not just for the rest of the classes that you're going to have here at UCI, but for the things you want to do in the future. Okay, now we're going to get back to coupling exergonic ATP reactions to drive endergonic reactions. And this occurs in basically three ways, and I'm going to give you an example of each of those. The first example is ATP driving chemical work. And the way this works is by using a phosphorylated intermediate. OK, so here we have glutamic acid that's a relatively stable compound, and ammonia that's another relatively stable compound. When ATP is around, ATP can donate a phosphate group to glutamic acid, and it makes this phosphorylated glutamic acid intermediate. The ATP turns into ADP, and if ammonia is around, then this, un this is a relatively unstable bond. This ammonia can actually replace the phosphate group, this bond here, and so you form glutamine, which is a combination of the ammonia, ammonia and the glutamic acid. A free phosphate, inorganic phosphate, is released as well as ADP. So this is the type of chemical work, phosphorylated intermediates, that's involved, for example, in forming polypeptides from individual amino acids. OK, we also talked about ATP driving transport work. And in this case, we have a phos um, phosphorylation of the protein that's doing the work. So ATP, in the case of the sodium potassium pump, if it's present in the intracellular region, will donate a, um, a phosphate group to the protein. And this protein then is going to bind what ions from the inside? <coughs> sodium. How many of them? Three. And it's going to change its shape and dump them into the extracellular space when phosphate is added. And then it will um, bind potassium ions. That will cause a conformational change that will um, cause a release of the phosphate group. And it will be reset for action. So it's that the phosphate from the ATP is what drives the ability of the sodium potassium pump to pump ions up their concentration gradients. OK, so we have phosphorylated intermediates. And we have phosphorylation of the proteins doing the work. And the third type is um, illustrated by ATP driving mechanical work, where the protein that's doing the work hydrolyzes the ATP itself and uses the energy directly. And the 
illustration here is my crude drawing of kinesin, which is a complex molecule. It has or a complex protein. It has um, two heavy chains, one shown here with a globular head that binds to what? <coughs> Microtubules. And here's another one binding to the microtubule. And the light chains are illustrated in red, and they're binding to a cargo. When these globular heads are bound to the microtubules, they have a high affinity for ATP. ATP comes in and binds, and this protein, the kinesin itself, actually, in the presence of water, cleaves this terminal phosphate and uses this energy to drive the conformational change of the protein, and it lifts this um, this back foot off the microtubule. So if this was the back foot of the kinesin, just bound ATP, it cleaved it, and then it moves forward and binds again, will bind another ATP, cleave it, release the ADP, and that's how it progresses forward, using ATP itself to directly derive the conformational change of the protein. OK, so in our demonstration of the large cell, I said we, we were looking for what, what are the features of one of these proteins, one of these motor proteins that they have to have to do movement. And they have to have binding sites on the, um, for the microtubule, shown here. They have to have binding sites for the cargo. And they also have to have binding sites for the ATP. So they directly use the energy from ATP because they can hydrolyze it themselves. So they're a protein that not only does cellular work by moving, but they hydrolyze the ATP. OK, so for the last exercise, what I want you to do, this table is in your notes, is to fill in this table where we're talking about cell process in the first column. and. The effect, if you were to replace all of the ATP in the cell with a non-hydrolyzable form, so you chemically, um, so you don't allow the um, terminal cleavage of the terminal phosphate, what happens to these cellular processes? And I have the first one illustrated up here, movement of water through aquaporin channels. There would be no change because facilitated diffusion does not require ATP. So go ahead, you don't have to do a card or anything, just um, talk among your groups and fill in your table and then we'll talk about it. And raise your hands if you have any questions. Okay, it sounds like your discussion is dying down. Let's go ahead and do this as a group. Okay, the first one that we have to consider is transport of ion channel protein to the plasma membrane. So where is an ion channel protein made? In the rough ER, that's right. And then it's packaged into a vesicle. And where does that vesicle go? What's the next organelle? Golgi. And then that organelle goes out to the plasma membrane, right? And so it's carried out to the plasma membrane on, by what, what was the process? It's kinesin, right? It's moving along microtubules. And why do you know it's kinesin? So it's going to the plus end, exactly. And those are located out at the plasma membrane. OK, so would this be affected if you had non hydrolyzable ATP? Yes. OK, because kinesin needs ATP to do the cellular work. OK. How about pH in the lysosomes? Would this be affected by non-hydrolyzable ATP? OK, everybody who says yes, raise your hand. Those who say no, raise your hand. OK, it's about 50-50. OK, it, the answer is yes. OK, and why? How does this change? Yes. Exactly, so there's a proton pump in the lysosomal membrane that is pump pumping protons. So what happens to the pH? Does it go up or does it go down? Raise your hand if you say up. Raise your hands if you say down. OK, down says more. OK, up is right. 
What direction does the proton pump normally pump? Pumps hydrogen ions into the lysosome. We increase our concentration of hydrogen ions, right? And so that means the pH gets more acidic. If I stop that pump from running, it's not going to be as, as acidic, right? So the pH is going to rise. Okay, so you can see how doing this type of exercise really makes you go back and think about all the things we've talked about in the future as well, I mean in the past, as well as, well as the things we're talking about now. Yeah? Doesn't the pH lower if it becomes more acidic? So the reason why this, the pH rises is because if you don't allow the proton pump to come in, uh, pump in, Hydrogen ions are normally being pumped in, makes it more acidic, and now they're not being pumped in. Yeah, so it's, yeah, so, so, I mean, at some level, drawing it is a really helpful thing to do because it's really hard to do it just by thinking of it in your head. Okay, co-transport of sucrose, yes or no, is it affected? Yes, most people say yes, and why, what is being affected? The proton pump, that's right. So the sucrose co-transporter relies on a hydrogen ion gradient that is generated by a proton pump that is using ATP. If the proton concentration is high outside, then protons and sucrose will both bind to the sucrose uh, co-transporter and the hydrogen ions will flow back into the cell down their concentration gradients, gra dragging sucrose along with it. Okay, and so this, if you were to actually um, increase the hydrogen ion concentration outside the cell, even though the pump had been altered, then you could still get the co-transporter to work. So this one is it's sort of an indirect effect. How about a G protein receptor mediated signaling process? No, why not? It's GTP, that's exactly right. So, and really important for this one, right, GTP is basically the, uh, very similar to ATP. It has three terminal phosphates, I mean three phosphates, and it's the hydrolysis of the terminal phosphate that's important for release of free energy. Okay, in our G protein receptor mediated signaling pathway, we have our G protein that's in the membrane. That's a transmembrane receptor. When it is activated, because it bounds a bond to a ligand, it changes shape and it moves down and it touches what that's on the inner leaflet of the membrane? A G protein. This is the G protein receptor. This is the G protein. It moves. Where is the GTP going to bind? To this or this? To the clicker, right? The ligand binds to the receptor, that moves, the GTP binds to the G protein that then can move in the membrane and activate a downstream uh, uh, enzyme. And that is a question that many people got wrong on one of the uh, uh, pre-class quizzes. Okay, and finally, movement of flagella. Will that be affected or not? Yes or no? Yes. That's correct, and why? Yes, uh, well, I've, I've heard from you. Anybody? I, I know, I hear some people saying it, but I can't hear it loud enough. What? Okay, what is the, yeah. <laughs> Very good, so it's dynein. Motor proteins, you have to remember, are in the flagellum. That's where the microtubules are. They're moving in the, negative, in the minus direction toward the minus end of the microtubules. And in the last class, a lot of people said myosin and actin. That's clearly not right, but they've got a motor protein inside the skeleton, but you have to know where they are. So in the flagellum, it's microtubules and um, dynein. Okay, so for the end, here's my my favorite version of Kinesin walking. There's lots of good animations on the web if you want to go look at them, but this is the funniest one. <laughs> okay, have a good weekend and I'll see you on Monday.